Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. And before I read it, I want to point out that I might be playing with fire by reading a text about a pesky lawyer to a congregation of lawyers. But I want to say that the lawyer in this scripture reading is not like the lawyers of Northridge Presbyterian Church. The lawyer in today's text is a canon lawyer, someone who is deeply versed in the polity and laws of the church in particular. In particular. So the church is his specialty. The church is where he practices his law. So I'm going to read lawyer because that is what our text tells us, but you should not automatically insert a lawyer you know from this congregation. This is really just a Pharisee who is deeply versed in the law. So hear now what the Spirit is saying to her church this day. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was in seminary, I worked for one of the smartest people I have ever met. Someone who could solve all of the world's most pressing problems but couldn't tie his shoes. Do you know people like that? That was Wayne. And for the record, at some point during the time I knew him, he wised up and just stopped wearing shoes with laces. Wayne was a founding member of the Teach for America board. He was the architect of what we now know as the AmeriCorps program. He founded the Bonner Scholars program. It is the largest scholarship of its kind. It's a service scholarship that exists at colleges and universities across the country. And what this program does is it seeks out the MVPs of service from graduating high school classes across the country, and it gives tuition dollars to these students so that they can continue their service work in college. Wayne's entire career has been focused on nurturing young leaders, cultivating their commitment to service. He wants to nurture and develop their conviction that this world can change so that long after they graduate high school and long after they graduate college, they continue to cultivate significant changes in their communities. In my work with Wayne, I traveled across the country and talked to high school students and college students and recent college graduates, likely college graduates who had, pers who had delayed graduate school pursuits just so that they could work in the nonprofit sector some studies say that the millennial generation is the most service-oriented generation since World War II. It's not really a surprise, though. How many hours of service does your high schooler have to do just in order to graduate? How many college students do you know who take full course loads, keep a full social calendar, and still manage to make significant commitments to service on top of all of those other commitments? As I traveled the country and met with young leaders, I would ask them who they looked up to, who were the people that inspired them to do what they were doing, and I'd always get responses along the lines of Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and Jimmy Carter when I was in Georgia, Mother Teresa. And so then I'd ask them, what was compelling about these people? And usually I'd get responses about their leadership abilities, these people can gather a crowd around something, they'd say. They had such good ideas about how to make big changes. And this always set me up to ask what I thought was a natural follow-up question. 
what do these people have in common, I'd ask. And usually there was silence. But when I'd gotten a list of people like Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa, it was easy for me to say, their faith, that's the thing that they share. Did you know Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor, I'd ask? And there were many for whom that was a new piece of information. For young people, Martin Luther King Jr. is the person who said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. They do not know that he was actually quoting words from the prophet Amos. In the same way, they know him as a leader and a civil rights advocate, not as a pastor. Similarly, many young people are surprised to learn that Habitat for Humanity is a Christian organization, not just a general service nonprofit. The Christian commitment to service is not unique. Service is mainstream. You don't need to be part of a church or a religious community to serve in our world. There are so many ways to step up for your community. And I'm glad people are stepping up. I love that people are spending their Saturday mornings hammering nails and planting trees and sorting food and clothes at pantries. But I think because service has become so integrated into society, it's easy for service to happen so that we get something out of it. It's easy for service to become a means to an end. Going back to those requirements for high school graduation, people serve so that they can graduate. People serve so that they have something to put on their college applications. College students serve so that they have something to put on their grad school applications. Plenty of adults serve so that they can demonstrate good character before a promotion. Service can even be competitive. When I was graduating college, I had a friend who was trying to figure out what she was going to do after graduation, and so she applied for Teach for America as well as applying to law schools, and her takeaway from that experience was it was much more competitive to get into Teach for America than to get into law school. So maybe the question, why serve, seems odd, since serving our city certainly doesn't require the church. But by asking why serve, we're asking both why we do it, as well as why Christian service is different from other types of service. The scripture we just read happens in the week leading up to Jesus' death. Palm Sunday has just happened, and Jesus is a really noticeable threat to society. People hate him more and more by the minute. And so they're closing in on him and asking questions. And like the lawyer in today's scripture, they're not asking questions because they are genuinely interested in the answers. They're building a case. They're asking questions to figure out what outrageous and blasphemous answer Jesus can come up with this time. They're adding to their list of reasons to dislike him. And so comes the Pharisees' question, which commandment in the law is the greatest? I can imagine that self-proclaimed expert of a lawyer smirking at Jesus, knowing he'd asked a gotcha question. Remember what I said at the beginning, this lawyer is not like the lawyers you know. This lawyer is an expert in all of those 613 laws of the Hebrew Bible. That is 613, 613. So how could Jesus possibly choose? Do you know that from among the 613 laws, there are 248 positive commandments. That's 248, you shall do this. And there are 365 negative commandments. 365, you shall not. That's a lot to keep up with. So it's no wonder the lawyer thought he could stump Jesus. 
But instead, Jesus responds, not with one commandment, but with two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. All of the laws can be boiled down to these two commandments. These are the hinges of our faith. In fact, we've been talking about these commandments ever since Jesus said them all those years ago. Rabbis have talked about the significant of the number 613 laws, as well as how they are broken down into the 248 positive commands and the 365 negative commands. The 248 positive commands, they correlate to the number of bones in the human body. And the 365 negative commands, well, they correlate to the number of tendons in the human body. In other words, the law is meant to be internalized. It is meant to be the very fabric of our beings. So Jesus' answer is really just driving home this point about the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, Jesus is saying, do what the law is already instructing you to do, Let these words inhabit your very being, and let these words direct your every thought, every prayer, every relationship, and every action. I think it's these words that set Christian service apart from other types of service. Because Christian service is born out of a genuine curiosity for the question, who is my neighbor? Habitat for Humanity was started when Millard and Linda Linda Fuller started asking the question, who is my neighbor? That question led them to ask questions about what they were doing to build a better world for their neighbors, which ultimately led to what we all know today as Habitat for Humanity. It was the question, who is my neighbor, that propelled Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela to fight for change. They asked that question, and then they got to work leading change in the interests of their neighbors. Interestingly enough, my colleague Wayne, who I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, went to seminary mid-career because as he continued nurturing young leaders, he recognized that the most sustainable and the most transformative changes were born of religious convictions. So he began an effort to reconnect faith and service, trying to reclaim service as a very tangible act of faith. My work with him was the beginning of an effort to launch what is now known as the Center for Faith and Service in Chicago. I want to tell you another story about the power of asking the question, who is my neighbor? The Arab-Israeli conflict has been at the top of the news cycle for decades. It is a conflict involving deep wounds and long-standing ideologies lived out by people who have experienced hurt and injustice on both sides. There are no shortage of divides in this conflict. There are the Arab-Israeli divides, the Christian-Muslim divides, Orthodox and Melkite divides, and this doesn't even get into all of the political divides. There is a man named Elias Shakur, who was a priest in the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. He is also a Palestinian Arab Christian who is an Israeli citizen, It is this sentence alone, which is why I have this manuscript today. There was no way I was going to get those details correct. As a Palestinian priest in the Holy Land, he embodies a lot of contradictions. As a child, Shakur watched helplessly as his family, along with all of those in his village, was removed from their land by the Israeli authorities making them refugees and outcasts in their own homes. 
So Shakur lived the shame of seeing all that his father had worked for disappear in an instant. He experienced the pain of being called a trespasser in the land of his ancestors. And yet, despite his personal history, and thus his deep ties to the causes of the Palestinian people, Shakur's vision is for something larger than fighting for one cause. From the moment he became a priest in the village of Ibeline in Galilee in 1965, Shakur has worked tirelessly for peace and reconciliation among all people in that region. In one of his books, Shakur recounts a visit with a large Jewish congregation in my former home of Atlanta, Georgia. Speaking to a crowd of about 800 Jewish people, Shakur said, In the eyes of Palestinians, in the refugee camps and the villages of the occupied territories, Jews are not decent, civilized, or educated people. They are soldiers or occupiers or terrorists. That is the image our children have of you. So our task is to rehumanize ourselves in each other's eyes. He went on to say, I do not have a nice dream to solve all this. Rather, we people from Galilee, we have visions, and we believe our visions become reality. He said, I have a vision of two children, a Jew and a Palestinian, who are friends. And one day these children celebrate their friendship, and the Palestinian child brings an Israeli flag for his brother, And the Jewish child brings his Palestinian brother a handmade Palestinian flag. And they exchange gifts and they hug each other and say, we were so ignorant, so blind to think that those who gave us money and weapons could show us the way. When Shakur finished speaking to this congregation in Atlanta, the rabbi of the congregation came forward with tears in his eyes. And he asked Shakur to give him a blessing in front of his entire congregation. And so Shakur placed his hand on the rabbi's head and offered a blessing in Hebrew. And then the rabbi turned to him and said, I will not become your brother. I have discovered that I was already your brother. And we did not know each other. Shakur's work is born of that simple question, who is my neighbor? So our question today is why serve? And though I've been sharing my own answers to these why questions with you as we go through this series, I'm not going to do that today. I will tell you, though, that I believe not a single one of us can answer the question, why serve, until we answer this question, who is my neighbor? So I'm going to leave you with that. Who is your neighbor? Let that question linger in your heart. Let it haunt you. Let it inspire you. Carry it with you not just to worship but to work. Carry it with you to the bank and to the voting booth. Engrave that question on the hearts of your children and your grandchildren and allow it to break your heart wide open. Let it stretch you. And you might find that by asking that question, you are bound to brothers and sisters who you do not yet know. Once you do this, then you'll be able to answer the question, why serve? Amen.